Is this working? Yeah. Very good. Um, so, geoengineering, large scale deliberate changes to the atmosphere, etc., to deal with global warming is almost a taboo topic in environmental circus, cir circles, often met with open hostility. What are the possibilities? Why are they so un unpopular? And can we really avoid needing them? So, my name is Sue Burke. I'm the moderator, and I'm moderating this panel because. I'll moderate anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Brother Guy Consolmagno. I'm a planetary astronomer. And uh, as I've mentioned to people who don't know me, uh, the reason I got into planetary astronomy was because I needed an excuse to go to MIT, which is where really where I wanted to go because they got the world's biggest science fiction collection. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all worked out pretty well. I suspect I'm on the panel because I didn't say no. It wasn't my idea, but it's a, a fascinating topic and feeds into uh, questions of terraforming in general. Hi, I'm Chris Gare. I'm on here because I also didn't say no, and I'm awake after lunch on Saturday. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, I, you know, I, I'm a geek, and I'll be a, hopefully be around for a while, so I'm interested in the topic in general, and um, I have opinions, so... All right, so what are some of the geoengineering possibilities? Well, there are um, basically two categories that I can think of, but I suspect that you could come up with some others. The one is some way of carbon dioxide removal, and that has real problems. And the other is some form of limiting sunlight hitting the Earth which has even bigger problems. Uh, but I'll, I'll let my... Uh, <coughs> so no, I mean, I, it, it's, it's, it's basic physics. You know, if you're getting too hot, you either, you know, you either figure out, not necessarily remove heat, but you, you, know, you figure out how to let more heat out or get less heat in. And uh, you know, the, the, the sunlight blocking solution that I've heard floated a lot is uh, putting dust in the form of uh, something called diatomous matter, which is basically fossilized tiny microscopic or semi-microscopic seashells, putting that in the upper atmosphere, uh, and then that will block, in theory, that will block enough light or coming in to reduce the, the solar radiation. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot of different carbon removal things. One of the ones that is floated, but I don't floated, but one of the problems with carbon removal is if you end up burning some more energy than you remove from carbon, it doesn't really work unless you figure out a way to do it without creating carbon. Um, and one of the kind of greener ways to do it is plant more trees and that kind of thing. The problem when this was discovered, um, that there was that bio, Earth 2 biosphere thing out in, I think, Arizona. Yep, north of where I live. Uh, it was discovered that, you know, it was thought for a while that warming temperatures would mean the plants would absorb more carbon, and the answer they discovered was no. They absorbed the same amount they always would, it just to cycle, because in a, in a biosphere, you know, plants absorb carbon, they drop parts themselves, leaves or whatever, that dies, it gives off carbon, Warming the temperature just makes that cycle run faster. You don't get any more carbon pulled out in, in a lower cycle. Just everything moves along quicker. You have, I, I've, got, I've got to tell my story. Go tell your story. I've been working to tell the story. So I'm going to tell this boring story whether you want to hear it or not. <laughs> the issue with uh, dealing with the carbon dioxide is basically it's a question of chemistry. And so I have a chemistry story. When I was in graduate school at Arizona learning planetary science, I shared an apartment with a guy who had uh, graduated from the University of Michigan in physics, brilliant physicist. He wound up being a physics professor at the University of Wyoming. Uh, his name is Bob Powell. And uh, at the time, I liked chocolate cake. I still like chocolate cake. My mother had given me a recipe for chocolate cake. One of the things you want in a cake is for it to rise. And this was called a never failed chocolate cake because they had two rising ingredients in it. They had baking powder, 
which is a mixture of a, 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 an acid and a base in powdered form with usually uh, some buffer to stop it from reacting until you want it to, and baking soda with sour milk. My physicist friend borrowed the recipe and attempted to make the cake. And as he's about to put it in the oven, I show up at home and he says, oh, I'm making your cake. Um, so I said, did you remember to put in the baking powder? And he goes, well, I noticed there was some baking powder on the shelf when we moved into the apartment last year. <laughs> and rather than you know, open our new can of it, I thought I'd use the old one and use it up. <laughs> Not knowing that baking powder eventually, even with a buffer, goes bad. It basically, it has reacted, it's not going to do anything. It's got a finite lifetime. But he said, but I said, well, there's the other, of course, you've got the sour milk and, and the baking soda. And he goes, well, what's sour milk? I go, it's, it's milk that's going on, you know, I just, milk is milk, right? He goes, no, <clears throat> I have to wait for it to go sour. You can make it sour by putting a little bit of vinegar in the milk. And that turns it sour, then you add it to the, uh, <clears throat> to the batter. And he looks at the, the batter, which is already in the pan, and he takes a little bit of vinegar and sprinkles it on top <laughs> of the batter. <laughs> Needless to say, the never fail cake failed. <laughs> the point of the story is that unlike physics, the order in which you do things in chemistry matters, and the reactions are not necessarily reversible. And this is one of the things we're facing in uh, attempting to turn the Earth back and away from global warming. There are certain irreversible changes that are happening as we speak. And there are other changes which, uh, like the, the stuff in the baking powder, are buffers which are finally getting overwhelmed. One of the buffers is the Earth's ocean, which has been soaking up heat for the last thousand years, so that even if you stopped all carbon dioxide input into the atmosphere now, it would take a thousand years for the built up heat that's in the oceans to actually cool off. The second are once you have melted the ice caps and raised the levels of the oceans, you are then flooding territory that can no longer be, you know, especially uh, territory that has lots of green plants like low-lying swamps that won't be available to, to do what they do anymore. And simply removing carbon dioxide isn't going to put that water back into the ocean, in, into the ice caps. It's this irreversibility that I think a lot of the uh, people I know who are talking about terraforming Earth are losing sight of. I've actually talked to people who said, oh, I've got this great way of getting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We'll, we'll put it into concrete. We'll put it into, uh, into kinds of rocks that could easily absorb carbon dioxide. And, and it is true, concrete absorbs carbon dioxide. It also absorbs heat and makes cities less than pleasant than the countryside. I, I guess I finished my rant, and I'll, I'll <laughs> turn it over. Now that I've said it's impossible, let's find out how it actually is possible. Well, I don't know that it, I mean, I mean, it is possible, but on a very long time scale, which was not the time scale we're looking for. You know, yes, once the ocean, once the ice caps melt, you're, you know, you're in a world of hurt. Uh, they will, and if you turn off the heat, they will refreeze, but we're talking, you know, 10,000 years, 100,000 years, I, you know, long, 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 long periods of time that are not really conducive to, you know, the stock market or next week's groceries bill or whatever. Uh, so I, I think, so that's the, and that's the big, I think the other big problem is, you know, even some of the things that are, the, 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 the diatomous material, the diatomous earth solution put in dust here, you know, we don't know what other you know, complexities or other comp complications that will reduce in the atmosphere. And that, that's one of the reasons a lot of these uh, geoengineering things are not real popular because you're trying, you're, you know, you're putting a band-aid on top of a, of a, 
another uh, put a solution up another problem that may cause other problems and we really don't understand what the problems are. Everything is going to have unexpected consequences. Some of them are probably going to be bad. Is there anything we can do? Well, outside of, you know, universal suicide, which would really pollute the planet with all those dead bodies. <laughs> and so I would not uh, recommend that. <coughs> I, I, I find hope in a couple of uh, things I see in human nature. In 2000, um, the Meteoritical Society held its annual meeting, and every meeting room had two slide projectors, so you could project the slides of your data for people to see. In 2001, the Meteoritical Society had its annual meeting, and in one room, there was an electronic projector if you wanted to hook up a computer to show this new thing called PowerPoint. In 2002, every talk at the Meteoritical Society meeting was in PowerPoint. Technology can change really quickly when the need is there, when the benefit is there, and when it's time. Um, another technology that I think took over the world fantastically quickly were cell phones. In you know, 2005, who had you know, a smartphone? Only the ultra rich. By 2009, everybody had a smartphone. You know, it, it happens very quickly. I can see technology that gets rid of the biggest polluters, the biggest sources of carbon dioxide, changing actually pretty quickly. Um, whether it's solar cells uh, in Tucson, where I live, you know, basically Just more than half the houses in my neighborhood are solar cells now. It's practical. It's you know a system that's not that hard to install. And I happen to live in a neighborhood where people have enough available capital that they can yeah. build, put up the cells now, and expect to be there long enough to see the payoff, okay. which is maybe five to ten years. Big movements and you know, top-down solutions I'm less confident of for the same reason that we talked before, that uh, we don't always know the consequences. And as we've seen okay. you know, with COVID, no matter how good an idea is, somebody's going to decide if you're telling me to do what I want. So I guess my take on it, the take on the panel is, can we fix global warming? I guess my answer is probably not. At least not in any, you know, human useful period of time. I, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. You know, the first rule of messes is don't make the mess bigger. So, you know, solar cells, LED lights, electric cars, you know, all that stuff is great and will help what should be done, but it, it makes a mess. But I think we're going to spend a lot of time uh, doing mitigation. You know, the Earth's getting warmer, so how do we protect wetlands? How do we avoid having cities flood out? How do we, you know, deal with some of the, you know, like I live here in Chicago. Uh, you know, we've had several years now where we've had, you know, massive rainstorms that are much, used, much more rain than we normally get, you know, and things flooded because this, most of this area was built on a swamp at one time. You know, so mitigation of, so, but, you know, I'm hearing even people that don't really, you would think don't believe in climate change are saying, well, gee, we're going to have a lot more rain, so how do we deal with the mitigation and some of these things that you deal with, you know, it's not it's not as massive as you would as you would be led to believe by those who want to argue that there's no such thing as global warming. One of, for example, one of the problems with urban flooding is all these hard surfaces. Now, everyone's got a, not everyone, but most people have a driveway that's made out of asphalt or concrete that absorbs no water, including yours truly. There's no particular reason you couldn't use permeable pavements, which would allow that water to go somewhere other than in someone's basement, as a mitigation. So I think that's what you're going to see a lot more of is mitigation as opposed to actual fixes. And a, and a lot of it's going to be on a small scale. That's going to be, you know, Joe, homeowner or Jane, homeowner says, I'm tired of having this problem. 
in my little neighborhood, so I'm going to do something to fix it, as opposed to, uh, just, you know, as again, we've seen all those zombie movies were wrong. People will run around, run right into the zombies, and there's no such thing as a zombie, because they get bit. <laughs> One of the things that uh, I think is important to also remember, the, uh, the carbon dioxide removal mitigation, it's happening. And it can reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere, the, the, the excess, by about a factor of 20%, which is better than nothing. So these efforts are happening. There, there are basically two types, as we've mentioned before, so people get, you know. One would be purely biological, so you have reforestation, you have agriculture, that is dedicated to creating biofuels. You have essentially, for lack of a better word, natural ways that nature has always been taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And the other are more you know, direct chemical, whether it's pumping CO2 into uh, ultramafic rocks below the ground or <clears throat> creating you know, cements that will absorb CO2 out of the atmosphere. If you're gonna make cement, you may as well make a cement that's doing some good. And these efforts are happening. They're not going to solve the problem, but they will certainly make the problem less bad. And even though it's going to take 10 years, I, I would be surprised if we don't have you know majority electric cars in 10 years in the US. I think it might happen that quickly because the benefits, especially in a crazy uh, oil economy, and we're getting crazy oil economies all the time, the benefits of having a reliable source of energy for the car that's going to have a, you know, a cost that you can count on. And the natural advantages of you know, running a car on electric rather than a, an engine that really, really wants to run at a constant speed rather than a variable speed in the long run. I, I can see it happening. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I, I think you might see the majority of new cars electric in 10 years. And I think the problem with that's gonna be, you know, the average car, stays on the road 10 years now. So, you know, there's still going to be a long tail of vehicles that are going to, you know, still be in internal combustion. And I do think that there is a, there is an argument or a case to be made for hybrid vehicles with, you know, a gas engine that powers a generator uh, for longer trips, because as long as it takes, even the fast charger takes an awful lot of time. I don't want to spend 15 or 20 minutes at a gas station waiting for my car to charge. So. If it meant that I could stop and have another donut, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I got too many donuts as it begins with, so. But I think this has a, also a, a science fictional outreach in a different direction, which is, you know, what about terraforming? We're talking about terraforming the Earth, basically. What are the, the, the ethical issues of terraforming another planet? What are the, uh, the, the engineering issues? And I think the, the science fiction world that has tried to do that, thinking about that in other planets, can perhaps something, have something to say about our efforts to terraform Earth. Well, I want to take the ethical first, which is my ethical is, um, for, unless we discover something buried under the sands of Mars that we don't know about, uh, I don't see any ethical reason or, or well, I'll, I'll use Mars. I don't see any ethical reason not to terraform Mars and not to terraform Venus. Well, you see, that, that's where we differ. Because I'm a scientist. I want to know what Mars turned into on its own before we screw it up. Oh, I agree, but we're, we're, we're going to have to because, right. you know, you're, the, the amount of, again, the amount of energy it takes to even think about terraforming, you're going to have to have a, it, it's not, you're not going to send three guys in one thing and have them play golfer around the golf and then walk they fly back and start careful. You know, you're gonna have to have a lot more information than just that. So. Ironically, the uh, terraforming of Mars is easy because it's trying to make it warmer. What we're trying to do on Earth is to make it cooler. I, I have a question. Now you keep saying we. Mm -hmm. um, who is the we? I mean, in the United States, we're doing some things, but there's a lot of political pushback. We say, well, we don't want to geoengineer the Earth. But what if China decides to do it? Can we even stop them? And that's a great question because um, we'll take something as simple as solar cells. Solar cells are great if it means we don't have to burn coal to make electricity. And they're even better in America if they're made in China because they're really dirty to make. 
and they have to be shipped from China to here, and that costs a little bit. And suddenly you realize the green cost of even green technology is not to be neglected. Um, but you're, the, the bigger point is you can't terraform part of the Earth. Um, there are things that we could do, I think, to incentivize, is that a word that we, we're, we're doing this kind of talk now. I hate, I hate that word, but I can't think of a better one. To make it cooler for people who want to do it. Um, the, I mean, one of the big problems is the deforestation of the Amazon. And we know how much forest is being lost by the Amazon thanks to satellites who don't have to depend on locals. If there could be a national system of, you know, the more green you've got, the more money we'll give you out of this pot of money that everybody's playing into, that would make the locals in the Amazon make it worth their while to not deforest, that might help the problem. I'm thinking of you know, my experience living in the Peace Corps in Kenya a zillion years ago, where um, they're living close enough to nature to know that they don't like nature because nature kills them. And yet, they've set aside large tracts of what otherwise would be nice farmland to give to your relatives and neighbors, instead for game parks, because they see that game parks bring tourists and tourists bring money. I, I mean, that, that the who's the we is, that's the biggest problem. I mean, we know we as a human species, you know, need to do something collectively, or at least, you know, let some people do something collectively, let the rest of them get the hell out of the way. Uh, but we as a human species have not figured out a good way to make these kind of decisions on, on a, the, the collective scale we need to. And that's, I, I guess it's one of those situations that's either going to, we're either going to fix it or, or we're going to fix it because there ain't going to be anyone here at some point. I mean, I don't think, I, I don't want to sound more exactly that, you know, we're going to go extinct and for a little warm, but, you know, it's one of those situations where sooner, sooner or later a problem will face humanity that we, we as a human species need to come up with a collective action on it. We either make that collective but, action or we won't be here to make the collective action. But sometimes the collective action doesn't have to be a directed collective action. There was no government that said everybody needs a smartphone. No. <laughs> we all decided individually that this was a really good idea. And they suck as phones. <laughs> yeah. But, but who needs phones anymore because we're not talking to each other. <laughs> well, let me start. Do you mind questions? Yeah. Uh, I, let me start there. So, Back in the 90s, I lived on the East Coast, and there was a story about um, one of the short towns was shut down, the, the beach was shut down because there was like amoebas or something in the, in the, in the water off of the Atlantic Ocean. And some local um, merchants did not like this because it cut into the tourist trade, so they got in their little dinghy and they went out into the, into the ocean and started dumping chlorine into the water. So my question is, yes, we can, if, even if you fix, figure out a way to fix it, how do you, how do you prevent the dummies from, from doing crazy stunts like this? I mean, you know, the past two years have shown us there's a lot of stupid out there. <laughs> um, and haven't there already been some people, like, I think there was some sort of, some dumping thing going on off the coast of Washington, um, like the west coast, like Oregon maybe, or I forget the, the specific. Someone, I think there was a, someone, some uh, tech bro, I don't know, I don't know who it was. I think maybe they were I should skiing say in the clouds or something. Well, they, they were dumping, I think, iron ore yeah. into the ocean as an idea that it would fertilize uh, algae and the algae would bloom, and the, the blooming algae would take carbon dioxide out. And you know, and as they as they die, they would take the carbon dioxide. Their bodies would decay and go down the bottom. I don't know. I don't know how much iron ore got dumped, and I don't know how much iron ore was supposed to be dumped, and how much was the you know things doing the money laundering. But <laughs> right. And, and it's precisely for that reason that I really think the solution is going to be lots of individuals making choices that make sense for them, which also turn out to be good for us. There are ways that we can encourage it, but I think we've learned that, uh, you know, enforcing it from the top down on individuals 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so um, if if you made it illegal to have vaccines, they'd be the first ones to, to want them. Uh, I wanted to uh, bring it. There's two recent books published in the last year. There's the uh, Ministry for the Future, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, and uh, uh, Termination Shock, Stevenson. And they both touch on all of this stuff. I uh, really recommend them. They, they, uh, I think they were, they seem like they were pretty well researched. Uh, and they actually touched on uh, several things that Guy said. Uh, the uh, termination shock, the whole premise is uh, some rich oil tycoon in Texas decides, well, governments are never going to get around to doing anything, and I, I'm just going to start doing something. So he builds the world's biggest gun, and he's shooting like, basically 55-gallon drums of sulfur into the stratosphere and s spreading sulfur dioxide in the s stratosphere uh, as a cooling method. And... Uh, this leads to all sorts of, uh, of uh, political strife because uh, they, they, they start running all these supercomputer models and they said, well, it's going to cool here, but it's going to ca cause you know, the monsoons to, be, to fail or be late in India. India doesn't like this. India starts doing uh, military raids to try to shut this thing down. Uh, there's all the sorts of stuff like that going on. And, but the, the low-lying countries, Indonesia, uh, the Netherlands, stuff like that, they're kind of like, well, you know, this is said enough in the future, just to, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years in the future that uh, they're, and they have some political power and they're like, look, somebody's got to do something and he's doing something. And we realize that putting sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere kind of sucks because it's going to really accelerate acceleration, uh, acidification of the oceans. But we've sat on our butts for so long at this point that our countries are just going to cease to exist in 15 years if somebody doesn't do something. And so they're kind of approving of this. Uh, it's, it's Your question? <laughs> no, I don't have a question. I just... Okay. <laughs> okay. A couple of books. There, there are books out there that we should... Uh, I'm... Uh, I haven't read either of them yet. I've been less impressed with Kim Stanley Robinson's science. Uh, he has red, green, blue, Mars, mm -hmm. and no hours in it. But uh, Stevenson generally gets it right. So I think those would be you know, well worth it. Certainly there is stuff, there are places there to write, including, um, you know, we're both coming down here, all, I guess all of us, as sort of being downers. And the, you know, the juvenile Heinlein fan in me wants to know, wants to believe that in all of these, uh, these gloom and doom scenarios, there is either a way out or a clever opportunity that people aren't noticing yet. Um, I think I might have lost the train. <laughs> um, oh, I think what it was, oh, there was this guy I saw a few years ago and he was trying to say, you know, this whole global warming thing, and you know, let's look at it from another point of view, he was saying. Let's look on the bright side. Sure, it'll have, sure, there'll be this and that effect on certain parts of the world, but Greenland will become available. <laughs> Russia, um, Canada, and, Canada. And if you look at a map, Greenland is as big as South America. So that's <laughs> <great>. Exactly. <laughs> now, and, and I'm thinking, well, you know, I, what he's saying may be true, the only thing is, is I don't know how it is that we were all, this move of people would take place peacefully. Yes. But, you know, everybody's just going to say, this world's not like a chess board where everyone's going to politely move up a latitude, right? <laughs> you know? Although, why not? If, if it's organized and you take, you know, if you've got advanced, I don't know. But what there's, do you all think of that? Well, the, the, the big problem is, I mean, there's a lot of problems. First place, yeah, obviously the guys looked at a, a map instead of a globe because, you know, Greenland and Canada are not as big as... as in and Russia, Russia. And all those, all those That's northern countries. That's a huge land mass. All these, but they're not, but they're not as not big as, as huge as he thinks. They're not as huge as he thinks. A <laughs> and B. One of the problems with all of those, let's just move our agriculture up north. Is a lot of these northern territories, there's really no soil or not very much, because. You know, because of geology. You haven't had the thousand years of other 
agriculture there that's turned the rock into soil. Yeah. Also, so it's not as, it's not as easy as it sounds. Right? Temperature alone doesn't dictate where a right. plant will grow either. It needs to have the right amount of sunlight right. per right. day. Right. Always right. sunlight. Um, what 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 you're saying reminded me of uh, an unintended consequence story with a happy ending involving <laughs> climate change. Um, and I learned about this story because at the Vatican Observatory in 1912, we got a meteorite from the Geological Survey of Egypt. Sign, it was a letter saying, here's this marvel. It was a knock letter. It was actually a Martian meteorite. They didn't know it at the time. And a lovely letter from a fellow named John Ball. So I looked up John Ball. And he was an Englishman in Egypt back in the days when, you know, pre and during World War I, and a little bit after World War I. And his big discovery was how you could drive a Model T Ford in the desert <laughs> without it getting trapped in the sand. And he recognized that sand dunes had a soft side and a hard side, and if you just kept to the hard side, you could drive your Model T Ford across the desert. You didn't even need roads. And he sent his aides off to uh, Western Egypt, and they discovered an enormous depression, which is now in the masses of Qatar Depression, which you know, is, is enormous. It's you know, basically a, a good chunk of Egypt. And it's territory that's below sea level when we're talking about depression. And it actually reaches not that far from the Mediterranean. So he had a climate change idea. What if we dig a canal from the Mediterranean to the Qatar Depression and flood this otherwise uninhabited area? We'll create a giant lake to the west of uh, in inhabited Egypt. The prevailing winds would pick up the rain, the water, dump it as rain in what had been a desert, and it would become a flourishing and marvelous place to live. So in the late 20s, he went back to England, maps in hand, here's where, because we've mapped out the area around where the, the canal is going to be, and you know, all I need to do is to raise a few million or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of pounds. The Great Depression came, no relation to the Qatar Depression. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he died in 1932, and the idea died with him. What was the unintended happy um, result of this? The area that had been thoroughly mapped for canals was a part of Egypt near the town of El Alamein. <laughs> ah. And some of you recognize that name as Rommel's armies are approaching Egypt to about to take the Suez Canal, the British army has their last stand in an area that they had completely mapped with drivers who knew how to drive vehicles in sand dune areas that the Germans didn't know about. <laughs> and uh, this man who's in the dream of changing climate uh, at least you know, stopped the Nazis from uh, taking over the Suez Canal. <laughs> Funny, there's a site where it reminds me of that the, there is the Great Rift Valley in uh, Eastern Africa. It goes through Ethiopia and through Kenya. Kenya. Yeah. Well, so I was saw on a reliable source, PBS, <laughs> that it is expanding and a lot of that is below sea level. And the, there's basically a natural dam that's the only thing that's keeping that from flooding out. And one of these days, that's going to flood out, and you know, we'll have another large, long Gulf of Great Rift, or whatever, the Great Gulf. Or whatever. It's uh, geology and Earth is constantly changing. Um, anyone who's lived in the Southwest is familiar with the Salton Sea, which was formed almost exactly that way. Uh, people had built irrigation canals from the uh, Colorado River to irrigate part of Southern California that was desert. And the Colorado River was so high one year that it overflowed the canals into this depression and created a sea that's still there 100 years later. I think the gentleman in the white hat question. Yeah, hi. I, I, uh, I guess when I think about potential solutions to global warming, I, I put them into two, two basic categories, right? So one are things that, that remove CO2, and the other are things that basically cool the planet in spite of there being high CO2. Right. Uh, you know, solar shields or sulfur in the atmosphere. And that, that second class seems to me to be really dangerous because uh, basically CO2 levels keep going up 
and you have to keep doing this actively. And if you ever fail to, uh, then suddenly you're going to get super warming, right? Because you're, you're, you're well, going to have all it's, the it's also dangerous because it could be that the plants you need to take the CO2 out of the atmosphere need the light that you're stopping from reaching the Earth. Yeah. It's, but uh, the point is that we do need to do both. We need to stop polluting so much, it would be incredibly useful to have an efficient way of taking more CO2 out of the atmosphere. And uh, other than leaving your refrigerator door open all the time to cool off the Earth, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know your second law of thermodynamics is not a particularly efficient way of doing it. Uh, there may be places where that kind of cooling, or accelerating that kind of cooling makes sense. I recall reading God knows how many years ago, and of course, because source memory is the first thing to go, I can remember the thing, but not where I've read it, um, that one major consequence of the diminishing polar ice caps is the albedo of the Earth is getting darker. What about ways to mitigate that? white rooftops or <laughs> painting deserts or something that will raise the albedo of the earth. Is that even a something that is well, worth trying? Or in, is in, that a f in a funny way, it's happening. Because of the increased energy in the atmosphere, areas that normally would not get snow, especially if it's so cold that it doesn't, you know, the snow, snow only forms when the temperatures are around the freezing point. If it's way too cold for that, it, it, the conditions are not right for snow. We're getting more snowfall in parts of North America that, and, and even in parts of Europe that we didn't before, which makes people say, oh, there's more snow, therefore there's no global warming. No, it's all part of the same climate change. Uh, certainly, we can design cities that do a more efficient job of you know, reflecting the heat and uh, you know, something better than concrete everywhere. White roofs is, is part of the you know self interest that you were talking about yeah. earlier. Yeah, you know, well, it's cheaper to air condition your house, your the, a building if the roof is white, right. and or, or even more cheap if you have it covered with solar cells. <laughs> so, can I, can I ask you? Yeah. Uh, that's a question about the. the a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be prefaced by a long discursive. <laughs> 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 No, the, the this is more of a question of Egypt, than a um, is, aside from the, the Great Depression, um, did anything ever come of it? Or, I mean, what, you mentioned the salt of the sea. I mean, it's, it's kind of contracting into a fetid sewer now. Yeah. But it's, that's because it hasn't been fed any new water. If, I mean, that sounds like at least a, you know, an interesting proof of concept. And if nobody lives there now... Well, I think part of the trouble is that uh, by nobody living there, they meant no Europeans lived there. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the area used to be a, a savanna back then. Yeah. I mean, wasn't that what and, and certainly, the old kingdom yeah. from the middle kingdom? Right. And certainly there are parts of uh, the Sahara that could become reforested, but which the de deforestation is going in the wrong direction, in part because of the poverty of the people who live there, who can't afford to look at the long term because they need to be able to have firewood today. I mean, not even, not even necessarily reforest it, just return it to what it was back in like 3000 BC. Well, I mean, we're... Big carbon sink. Um, and that helps. That certainly would be the kind of idea that would be good to be able to do it. And the difficulty with, with climate change is not that it's happening. Because climate change has always happened. It's that it's happening so quickly. It's happening faster than human beings can adapt. It's happening faster than animals can adapt. And so to do what you're talking about, it took 10,000 years for it to go away. We can't afford 10,000 years for it to come back. But that is the sort of uh, activity that one could envision, at the very least in a science fiction novel, and a, a clever government figuring out how to do. Well, and again, I mean, so... One of my other things is I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Rotarian, and you know one of the things we do is we do uh, international, we do projects where we try to assist communities better themselves. And one of the things that it's, we do that a lot of organizations do, 
is rather than rather than have this big massive project where you build a you know ginormous dam or whatever, it's you know getting uh, solar powered lights to uh, third world villages that otherwise don't have electricity. And it's a, it's a it's a light you know light like that, a little solar cell that you put out and it's got a battery. What that does is, besides giving them the light to actually do homework at night, they're not spending money to buy kerosene, to burn kerosene, to light their house. Those are the kind of things that can be done. The problem is, and we as Americans are really bad about this, is we're looking for the gee whiz, multi-gazillion dollar silver bullet that fixes everything as opposed to, you know, hey, just, you know, make these and, you know, you know, small changes as opposed to large changes. One of the examples of this lighting system, and uh, your, your group may be involved in this, there are slums, especially in Rio de Janeiro, where the tin roofs are so tightly packed that even in the daytime, it's pitch dark inside the shelter. Somebody realized you take uh, you know, a two liter soda bottle, plastic soda bottle, fill it with water, cap it, put a hole, a tiny hole in the ceiling that you can shove this thing into, seal it up, sunlight hits the top of the soda bottle, bounces around and around and around, and comes out the bottom of the soda bottle and illuminates the interior of these buildings. <laughs> it costs nothing, it, uh, except the, uh, an empty soda bottle that was probably going to be part of the trash. And it provides these kinds of small-term solutions adopted by lots of people, I think, are, are going to be the answer, rather than uh, waiting for somebody else to do the big project. And I think the other part of the solution, with the other thing we need to be cognizant of is, you know, there is, there is some, one of the reasons that China and India have been kind of resistant to get onto the climate change thing is because, you know, they have large populations of people for whom a soda bottle sunlight catcher would be a two steps up. And they're like, well, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to condemn our people to, you know, grinding poverty while you fat Americans, you know, sit around in your air conditioned houses. So it, it's, you know, part of the issue is, is we need to recognize that everyone needs a chance to improve their standard of living as well. And that's, but that there's an advantage to that, which is improved standard of living means less population growth, which is another set of good solutions. Except that also leads to other problems. Now there's a you know, population decline beginning in China, happening in the US, there's zero population growth the last couple of years. And in the long term, not having so many people, I can see the advantages. But in the short term, um, who's going to be doing the work and paying the social security taxes that I was hoping to live off? <laughs> uh, we're already seeing in the US economy right now what happens when there's a shortage of people to do the work that I don't want to do. And I don't want to pay anybody else to do it, but it's got to get done. The social, which is to say that every solution carries with it certain problems, but likewise every problem carries with it certain uh, advantages. I mentioned my, my Peace Corps time 40 years ago in Kenya. And I don't claim that what I'm saying is current anymore. But certainly at that time, Kenya had the highest population growth of uh, any nation in the world. And that was in part because they had the same birth rate as most of the other nations, but they were developed enough that they didn't have the same death rate. And this was putting tremendous strains on the economy, but it also meant that you could always get a job teaching as a teacher, because there were lots of kids, and so they needed lots of teaching, and so if, therefore there was a benefit to get an education. And you wound up having one of the better educated populations in the third world. It's the, the kind of connection that you wouldn't think happening would happen. But which I think, to go back to the theme of the science fiction convention, I think science fiction, when done right, does a great job if you can start pulling at some of these threads and, and to be able to see, ah, oh, if I made this change, 
in our society, what would be the five consequences that you were hoping for and the three that you didn't expect? You've been... Yes. Um, I saw a very scary uh, Nova episode last week. The, the permafrost is melting and there are permafrost craters that have exploded with uh, where the methane pressure has blown out. Irreversible and, change again, yeah. And uh, the, the short version is it seems to be happening all over Alaska and Siberia mm -hmm. and, and probably northern Canada. Um, one of the things that hit me a long time ago, back in the 60s when the ecology and stuff became aware, aware to the mundane, uh, my first exposure to word ecology was uh, um, in the Heinlein novel, um, the colonization of Ganymede. Um, and I'm, a, I'm an engineer. You know, I'm one of the many smart people in fandom. Uh, but anyhow, back then, I think the issue was mercury poisoning of fish that we were thinking of. That I said, you know, we may already be beyond the tipping point. That we may have already killed ourselves off. And we won't find out about it for 50 or 100 years, and then it'll be far too late. It may even be too late now, even if we knew about it. And, and that certainly, if, if you look at it as a linear system, or even as a one-dimensional system, that certainly is a possibility. Fortunately, society is complicated enough that there are hidden resources we won't even realize we needed until they're there, as well as hidden traps that we wouldn't even realize we needed. Uh, you say it goes back to the 60s. The guy who first worked out the idea that uh, excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would lead to a warming climate was an Irish scientist in the 1860s. And if I were really good, I'd remember his name. It's on my slide of the, of the <laughs> The one thing I do remember about him that though he was Irish, he was viciously anti-church and said we should <laughs> kill off all the priests. <laughs> he was in 18... 1870s. So he was a Protestant Irishman. Uh, you can find articles about CO2 and climate change in the Reader's Digest of the mid-50s, 1956, I think there was an article about it. This is not an idea that, you know, Al Gore invented. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, we have two minutes left. Is there someone who hasn't asked a question yet? Um, so many years ago now, I was at a science fiction convention and I held a uh, hydrogen power cell in my hand. And this was the future of energy as was fusion. <laughs> what so it's only 20 years away. Well, <laughs> so hydrogen, I mean, hydrogen is a pain in the ass to work with because it's, you know, because it's such a low density gas and the molecules are so small that the hy hydrogen can actually go through most of wells. the plumbing. Yeah. I mean, go through, and so, and it's, of course, it's lighter than air, and when it burns, it burns invisible. You can't see a hydrogen fire. Now, everyone saw the Hindenburg. That, what that, all that fire you saw was not the hydrogen. That was the outer hole of the vessel burning. Aluminum, thermite. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of issues with hydrogen as far as as far as the fuel cells. Uh, but you can do the same fuel cell with methane. If you're and if you're getting your methane from a you know a renewable resource like a biofuel resource or just making methane out of carbon dioxide in the air and just recirculating it, and then you can do the same thing and have a, uh, less of a problem. There are, there are lots of people coming up with lots of great ideas, and we only need one of them to work. But we, you know, I'm not the one to tell you this is the one to put your money behind. So a concluding remark? Um, I guess the message I had is that 
I think we will fix global warming because we have to, but it won't be in any of the big projects that uh, we're thinking of. It'll probably be um, something small done over and over again by people who don't even realize they're doing it. I would say yes. I, I'll, I'll just say amen to that. All I think it's been a lot of small things, but yes. And I think there'll be a lot more mitigation. You know, it wouldn't go fix it, and we'll just figure out how to deal with it better. Yeah. Because we have to. All right, well, I thank you all for coming, and I hope that you came over with some ideas. <laughs>